The Ukrainian gas company Burisma, which is at the heart of President Trump's impeachment trial, specifically because Hunter Biden, the son of the Democratic frontrunner Joe Biden, once sat on the board. And earlier this month, we learned that Russia hacked into Burisma. And now Ukraine wants the FBI to help investigate because of fears of more election interference here in the 2020 election. It's the kind of stuff that keeps our next guest up at night. John P. Carlin was the Assistant Attorney General for now national security, and he talked to our Hari Srinivasan about the ever-rising cyber threat. Give us a lay of the land here. Who are the kind of nation-state cyber warfare players of consequence? I'd say there's four major players, uh, nation-state players in cyberspace. North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China. And that's according to both the views of the intelligence community and the cybersecurity community that monitors these threats. The other one to call people's attention to, though, is what I call the blended threat, which is we've seen an explosion. Billions of dollars have funded it in the organized criminal groups that try to attack companies and individuals to make a buck. And increasingly, we see a blend between the traditional nation state activity and those criminal groups in both directions. We mm. see that the nation states, at the direction of their leadership, when they want to do an attack, use those criminal groups and their tools as proxies. On the other side, you also have corrupt government actors, and they want to make a buck on the side. So they'll use state tools to do a criminal activity, and they really just want to, they really just want to profit. So what kinds of capabilities are we talking about? Because it's not just the computers that can be attacked. It's also the computers that are in charge of real-world infrastructure, for example, and the kind of ripple effects that, could, that normal people could see on a day-to-day -day basis. We certainly know that very sophisticated actors like Russia and China have repeatedly shown that they're able to get access. Now, they don't necessarily use the access they have mm -hmm. when they get it in certain critical infrastructure, but in the event of severe tensions between the nations or war, you could see them exploiting it. More worrisome is you see North Korea and Iran trying to follow suit, and they would. Uh, use that use that capability, and I think it's something we need to watch for now as tensions increase with Iran. Another just side point on that, though, is that's critical infrastructure the way we traditionally thought of it. So it's regulated space, electric, mm -hmm. water. We're increasingly moving towards what's called the Internet of Things. So when we talk about that transformation of data and connecting it online, increasingly we're starting to connect everything. So that's the cars on our roads. We've already had an instance, and this is back when I was in the Obama administration, where there was a proof of concept hack, and you could so using the entertainment system, you could control the braking and steering system of a Jeep. And that caused the recall of 2.4 million Jeep Cherokees with the idea that, hey, that's just like the brakes not working. That's a safety yeah. flaw. But they were already out on our roads, and then you do the recall. When we talk about these nation state actors, how do they prioritize and what are their interests? I mean, is it about disinformation? Is it about stealing money? Is it about wreaking havoc on the economy? What are they trying to do? Yes, it's about all of those. <laughs> all <of the> <laughs> but it depends on the it depends on the state state actor. So uh, Russia, in addition to to uh, obtaining money um, and its blend with criminal groups, in, in, in some respects, they seem to think that just attacking American and Western interests anywhere in the world is to their benefit. And so they are purveyors of chaos, and they attack things like our institutions and democratic institutions and our trust and faith in them. China's been more focused on uh, traditional national security goals, so uh, state actors, from their perspective, human rights uh, activists or others, and then this economic uh, espionage, so theft of, of trade secrets. North Korea, bank robber. They want to raise currency. They've literally conducted essentially a bank heist, the so-called SWIFT hack that's been uh, publicly indicted. And they also use their capability to, to bully uh, and try to in influence the world where they're otherwise weak politically, like they did with the, their attack on Sony, where they didn't like mm -hmm. the content of a movie. Right now, Iran is the one that we're most concerned about because we're in an increased period of tensions with them. What 
has Iran already done? What are some examples, perhaps, of what their capabilities are? And in some ways, Iran has been the most destructive nation-state actor on the world stage, with North Korea maybe a close second. They've shown the most willingness to use. They don't have the, the top capability. I still would put that with the United States, uh, Russia, China, mm -hmm. at some extent Israel. But they've shown the intent to use the capability that they have. And this dates back to 2011 inside the United States, where they were the first nation state to use cyber to launch an attack against American institutions. And what they did is a, it's called a distributed denial of service attack. And it's basically the idea is they gained access to hundreds of thousands of compromised computers and then using something called command and control, including, you know, your computer at home could be mm -hmm. one of those compromised computers. They could access all those computers at once and cause them to bombard a public facing website with requests for data, they get overwhelmed with data and it doesn't work. So it's all those computers are trying to go to the same website at the same time and then nobody can get it. Exactly. And that's what they did to the financial sector. So they targeted major banks. It was a time, another time of tension between our countries. They launched these distributed denial of service attacks against the public facing website of the bank and you're the customer. Mm -hmm. So much of us have moved to online banking. You can't access your account. It affected hundreds of thousands of customers and cost tens of millions of dollars to over 46 different financial institutions. At the beginning of that threat, you know, I, I was at uh, FBI at the time and later in Department of Justice. You know, we hadn't really, we still, our default was to treat these cyber threats as secret. Now, this is a nation state issue. It's between nation states. We should do what we did with the Cold War, which is monitor it closely maybe take action against that state, but you don't tell anyone about it in the mm -hmm. private sector or otherwise. And I think we got better and then ultimately publicly prosecuted the individuals that did that. And they, they were affiliated with the IRGC, some uh, kinds called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Mm -hmm. That is the group that Soleimani, who was recently targeted and killed by uh, American forces, led. So th those were the actors attacking our financial sector all the way back from 2011 to 2014. While we were doing that, we saw other destructive attacks by Iran. We saw them use what's called a wiper malware in an attack against uh, Saudi oil infrastructure, Aramco. It was very effective and disrupted their production for a period of time. But that, yeah. that means it goes in and basically wipes the software or some of the data that's sitting inside a computer off? Yeah, if you think about it at home, if that, if that hit, it basically turns your computer into a brick. You know, your computer is, it, it, it doesn't do anything without code. Right. And there's malware that wipes all of the code from the operating system of your computer. We saw that overseas and issued warnings here, but we also saw that the first destructive attack on U.S. soil by a nation state using that same wiper type malware was actually against the Sands Casino, not critical infrastructure, you know, hmm. gaming uh, institutions. Why, why them? And... What had happened was the head of the Sands Casino, Shelley Adelson, had made some provocative remarks about Iran, turning them into a nuclear dust cloud. Mm. The Ayatollah was not amused and issued essentially a fatwa against and called for jihad against the uh, Shelley Adelson and, and the Sands Casino. So in this day and age, that jihad translates into a cyber attack. That's not right. This is, a, you know, with, I think the first instance, at least in the U.S., where we saw that happen. And they launched that malware. And actually, was it, luckily, there was someone quick thinking in the information technology staff at SANS that essentially pulled the plug and kept it from spreading all throughout their network. So it, it, took, it took out a more uh, distinct, you know, separate facility. How about China? We know that there's corporate espionage that's happening. Uh, American companies have said that out loud. Um, what are their capabilities? So we talked a little bit about this new, new approach taking place, uh, led through the Department of Justice and FBI when I was there, but echoed by other parts of the government of taking what used to be in the shadows or secret in terms of nation state behavior and starting to have a strategy of figuring out who did it when you see bad mm -hmm. cyber activity, making it public, and imposing consequences, sometimes using the criminal justice system. Actually, the first case that we brought and this was in 2014, was against China. It was against five members of the People's Liberation Army, mm -hmm. this specialized unit, 61398. And 
all that unit did was attack the private sector. So they would hit places like universities, they'd hop from there into companies, and then they stole massive amounts of data, intellectual property, trade secrets, billions of dollars worth of data. The former head of the National Security Agency, Keith Alexander, called it the largest transfer of wealth in human history. So this was significant. It's why President Obama declared it an economic, a national security economic emergency. President Trump has, has reauthorized that same, that same declaration. And China continues to be quite active at now maybe less stealing from a company for the direct commercial gain of its adversary, mm -hmm. thanks to an agreement that had been reached between the two countries. They're definitely still quite active at stealing from companies for the benefit of the state. And that's a hard, you know, from the U.S. perspective, we don't see that distinction the same way, the same way they do, right? Stealing, stealing. Yeah. Right. And they also, in addition to stealing, stealing state secrets um, or trade secrets, and they do both, they also have been taking just bulk data. So you saw the attacks on Anthem. You've seen attacks on the hospitality sector. And what they're taking there is just as much data about you and me as they can. So, so if you have my, my, my Marriott travel habits and possibly health care records, what do you do with it? Is this something that you use to compromise an individual? So I can see some ways they would use what they've stolen now to try to track law enforcement agents or intel operatives they dislike to target human rights uh, mm -hmm. activists. I also think, though, we're on the cusp of new developments in so-called artificial intelligence or machine learning. They're collecting this massive repository of data, and they may not know how they're going to use it yet, but data is the new oil mm. or gold for this age, the way oil and gold have been for previous uh, ages. They're sitting now on this huge um, pool of data, and so it may be they end up generating insights or more effective algorithms or, or artificial intelligence five or ten years from now. Let's get to Russia. I mean, our concern primarily as Americans has been watching Russia meddle in the U.S. elections in 2016. Um, is that continuing? Yes. Uh, so we should be concerned about Russian activity heading into our 2020 elections. Russia is increasingly a rogue uh, nation when it comes to its cyber activity. They view democracy as an existential threat, and we're not the first democracy that they've tried to attack or undermine confidence in. But they've also done things like unleash what's called a ransom worm. Um, this was something called not Petya. Mm -hmm. So this is, there's a technique called ransomware that the crooks are using. And what that does is it, it puts malware on your computer. So when you go to log on, you get often it's a skull or something scary, and it says all your data is locked up. It's encrypted. If you want to access it, go here and pay a fee. And th there's a reason why that's uh, been just exploding, and it's because many people are paying, and the criminal groups are making a lot of money doing it. We've even seen police departments, hospitals, and municipalities in the U.S. pay these crooks ransomware. What Russia did in this ransom worm is it was like ransomware, but it's self-propagated. And where it started was for a specific national security purpose, they deployed it in Ukraine, trying to attack Ukrainian institutions, but then it spread all through the world. And unlike the, the criminal version of it, there was no way to pay to get access to your data again. This caused uh, over, I think, $500 million worth of damage, well of it, to uh, Maersk shipping alone. It hit Merck. It hit it cost $300 million to FedEx. So it hit everyone, it hit all of our uh, allies. We did not do enough, I think, in response to that utterly irresponsible, indiscriminate use of this tool to deter them from doing that type, type of thing again. So our intelligence says that at least three voting system vendors were compromised. We've had another kind of investigation show that at least a few dozen different voting systems were connected to the internet when we were told that they're not, yeah. right? Um, how safe are we from cyber meddling in the upcoming election? We're, we're better than we were, but we still, uh, every state at this point 
should have a paper ballot backup system. There's just no excuse for not having it. And a couple of states don't. And uh, in, in disclosure, I have a, a pro bono suit where we've sued the state of Georgia, and it's a year and a half, two years into the suit now, to try to force them to adopt better protections and not use unsafe technology for, for voting. That's one area. Mm -hmm. It was great that the federal government uh, finally un uh, released funds because the problem, and we're seeing this with the ransomware plague hitting cities like Baltimore and others, is it's not just the election system. They're generally their infrastructure that the, you, they rely on to provide city services, so, so our health and safety depend on it, are they don't have the resources and they don't have the technical skill set, and so they're not hardened against even not particularly sophisticated adversaries. And people make mistakes, as you talked about, mm -hmm. and take systems that should be off, uh, off the internet and plug them in or put a thumb drive where it shouldn't, shouldn't be, and that's oh. a way to get code in. So we need to have uh, funding, just like we do in other areas, to help them get up to speed and, and protect their systems. Uh, recently, a local reporter, uh, I want to say in Topeka, asked uh, the president uh, a question about our cyber capabilities. Let's take a look. What is the administration doing to guarantee the uh, the safety of, of our systems, our banking systems, our, yeah. our grids, uh, our computer systems in this country? Well, it's a great question. Cyber is a whole new thing. It's a whole new field. We have some tremendous people. Uh, we're better at cyber than anybody else in the world, but we weren't really using that power, that intellect on cyber. We weren't doing it, and now we are. And we have, I have, incredible people in charge of cyber. Uh, if we ever get hit, we'll hit very hard. We'll be able to hit very hard. But it's a new form of warf warfare, and I think we have it very well under control. Do we have it under control? Uh, no. Uh, I think there have been improvements, and there are some good, uh, excellent officials still at the Department of Justice, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and our military and intelligence services. But the problem is getting worse right now, not better. And Why? That's a couple of reasons. One is we continue to move into vulnerable areas. And so right now, the technology does not exist to keep a dedicated adversary out of a government or a company system, no matter how much you invest. Uh, and so that's true if it's an internet-connected system. That's true of sophisticated nation states, and it's increasingly true of these organized criminal groups. What we need to do as a nation, it's an urgent time, and we need leadership from the commander-in-chief on down, is to say, we're at an inflection point. You know, before we move towards adding these billions of new devices on the internet of things using mm -hmm. this insecure technology, we need to think about risk and price it into our decisions. There are major gains. I mean, having self-driving cars might massively reduce traffic fatalities, sure. but we got to do so in a way that, that takes into account it's not just whether they work, it's whether they'll work if a bad guy wants them to and incentivize security by design. And we haven't taken the steps yet to do that. It's not forced by regulation. Congress hasn't taken action to try to uh, improve safety on it. I know when I wrote my book and talked about real cases mm -hmm. that we did at the department, when I go around and talk about them, people think it's science fiction. They don't realize that it already, already occurred. So we need to have a, a demand for action before we start putting new things into this vulnerable space so we, so we do it safely. John Carlin, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.